Hi, this is Masha Slamovich. Make sure you subscribe to DNC Digital. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy D from DNC Digital back with another episode of DNC Radio. Today's guest is Masha Slamovich. Masha is a professional wrestler that in just five short years, she's already competed in multiple countries. I think it's six. And uh, she's originally from Russia, but she's uh, wrestled out here in the States and Japan and other countries. And we're going to be talking to her about everything going on and uh, what this, what the status of the business is like over there since it's halfway across the world. So Masha, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me on tonight. No, I know. I I, uh, I started following you about a year ago, I think. And then um, we spoke a little bit. And then, um, you know, I, I, I feel like your career uh, got a little got got bigger since then, obviously, in the past year, um, but despite the pandemic. But uh, here we are finally, um, finally talking. And I finally got you on the show. And I'm excited about it. So you're originally from Russia. And I know that uh, you wanted to uh, you wanted to wrestle since you were a little girl so so um exactly from where in russia are you i am right from moscow russia which is probably the most well-known city in russia. right um so t- tell me about that episode of smackdown that you were watching that made you want to be a professional wrestler what what match was it that you were watching you know i can't exactly remember the match i just remember like i i'm like almost positive that i remember seeing people like chris benoit on it like probably batista or something like that you know like the the good old smackdown roster but you know it was less of like seeing a person and being like enamored with it I guess it was just the energy of it I suppose you know it was just like there was it was just like calling out to me as ridiculous as that sounds but that just it just captured like my mind and my heart immediately and you know well ever since then (laughs) so I, I I read that you were running and swimming every weekend with your mom was that in preparation to being a, a professional wrestler? Did she know what you were trying to do, or did she think that you really did want to go out, out and run and swim with her? Well, the swimming started when I was two years old because my mom was um, a competitive swimmer back in Russia. So that, you know, she wanted me to swim because she swam. That was that was her doing anyways, but I was, you know, I was good at it and I enjoyed it. So that, uh, that was great. And then I ended up uh, competing in swimming in high school myself. So that was kind of like a, a separate thing that just played into wrestling, you know, and I suppose the running, like it started out with her being like, you know, I just want my daughter to be an athlete like myself and like be healthy. And then later on that, was kind of like the foundation of like my obsession with fitness, I guess, because, you know, you do it from so young and then it becomes a habit. And then that, you know, kind of escalated into me pursuing weightlifting and all that other stuff, which was done in preparation for wrestling. Uh, So now having your mother as an athlete, was, was that an easy transition to, you know, you training to be a professional wrestler with all it in terms of fitness and in terms of exercising and stuff? It was definitely beneficial. You know, I, I imagine if I didn't constantly, I wasn't constantly active as a kid, I suppose it would have been harder, but, you know, I, I, it's like the discipline of being an athlete in the, you know, in any realm. So I guess that definitely made it easier because I was just so used to, I was just so used to just getting up and doing it. Even if I didn't want to, you know, my mom was like, come on, let's go get up and run you know, hurry up. We got other shit to do today. Like we got to get this over with. So I guess that definitely played into like me nowadays when I have to get up and run, I'm like, well, I just got to get it over with because it's going to have to happen anyways. 
Uh, I, I read that you started weightlifting when you were 12. Now, my, my girlfriend was a powerlifter in high school. Can you tell me about that world and how different it is than training in other, any other sport? Um, well, I started out weightlifting when I was, when I was 12. And then it, it was during the same time when I had joined the track team. And then I had switched from one school to another to a different track team, which in then I think I was like 14 already after two years of just regular straight up weightlifting. I switched over into doing CrossFit because that was what my coach did. So she made all of us do it as well. So that kind of just sucked me into its own world. And I have never, I I have trained for wrestling in multiple countries, and I have never in my life suffered in training the way I have doing CrossFit training, <laughs> because I, I love it, and I'm addicted to it, but I mean, it sucks. It just does not ever get any better. Like, you think you'll get used to it. You're never going to get used to it, and if you've ever done CrossFit, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, I I I, I want to say that it's it's a it's a double edged sword because I've done it a few times, but I want to say that when you're in it and you're kind of you know you're motivated and everything, but when that thing is done, like you're dead, and not only that, for me it's difficult to like get up to try to want to do it. Like I didn't have anybody as as tough as your mom, I guess. My mom is tough in a different way, but your mom is like, like let's go, get up, get up, and um, I guess that that definitely helped you. Um, uh, moving on. Uh, so tell me, so tell me about that conversation you had with, with her when, uh, you know, you turned 18 and you were looking up, um, wrestling schools, you ended up getting trained by Johnny Rods, who, uh, is a trainer for a lot of wrestlers out there. Can you tell me about that conversation that you had with your mom and what her reaction was when you were telling her that you were being serious about doing professional wrestling? Uh, well, just to correct you, I wasn't 18. Uh, I was 16 when I started training. Oh, okay, okay, So, okay. yeah. But, um, one, you know, she always knew that I was serious about it. But, you know, she was just like, hey, you're going to grow out of it. Like, just, just stop with that shit. And, like, one day I actually legitimately came to her with, like, Johnny Rods. You know, I was like, Mom, I called Johnny. He said he wouldn't you know, like fully talk to me because I'm not 18. So I'm going to need you to call him and like, we can go down there and talk to him. But I came to her with like a physical thing. Like, not like I want to be a wrestler. Like here is a school that we can go visit so that I can become a wrestler. Yeah. You did and your homework before I, you brought it to her. Yeah. So yeah, I wouldn't stop pestering her about it. And she knew that I was not going to stop about it. So she went down there with me and we sat in that office for like five hours or something. And you know, Johnny talked to me, he talked to my mom, we all had the conversation. And then basically when I left, I was like, you know, so we're doing this. And my mom just, she was like, yeah, you know, there's no way out of it now. She's already dragged me here. She's definitely not going to shut up about it. And then literally we signed up like the next day. And then Monday, I was already, it was a Saturday when we went and Monday I already started training. So uh, when you moved out here from, from Russia, how, how old were you? Uh, very young, like not young very enough, young. not old enough to, yeah. But I remember, um, if we're talking about like childhood stuff, I just remember coming to school, uh, like kindergarten or whatever, and okay. not knowing any, and apparently none of the other kids knew English either because they all like spoke Spanish or whatever language. So it was just extremely confusing because literally nobody could communicate. And I'm just like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> what's going on nobody's speaking the the language of the of the of the country we're in right now that's um so um you 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 got a list of uh of inspirations you got and and it's a cool theme that i see going on you got uh chris benoit uh sean michaels brett and owen hart chris jericho jushin liger um what is what is it about the dynamite kid though because you say that you you take a lot of inspiration from him as far as moveset and especially the gear. When I feel, I feel when you, um, when you kind of do your gear in homage to a certain wrestler, that, that, that wrestler means a lot. Can you tell me about the Dym dynamite kid and what, what he meant to you? Uh, the dynamite kid was, 
you know, it was it was like uh, I, I always took, take the comparison of him and Chris Benoit together because mm -hmm. yeah, you know, they're, they're like Benoit, same immediately same. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's like it's like the, the, they're pretty much the same thing. Like the the closest potential copy that there could have been to Dynamite Kid was Chris Benoit, and yeah. when I watched Chris Benoit, it like not only was his style very you know strong and fast and it was like no it was very no nonsense and you know as a kid i was i was a little aggressive i got to i got to my old fights and scraps as a kid so i uh, i could relate to that kind of aggression as a kid i kind of like i always saw myself in him and then especially when i like found uh dynamite kid i like read his book you know watched his matches like all of like i did all of my research throughout the years and it was you know as like fucked up as it sounds because i you know they're you know how they are i'm sure you've yeah read them. I, I i totally understand yeah when I, say I see myself in them i'm like sure whatever you want to call me an asshole i am most certainly not an angel so i will openly admit <laughs> that not only did i love that style of wrestling i saw myself in them and i guess it's like the napoleon complex as well because i was always and still am like a not the largest person so when i was a kid i always mm -hmm. had the napoleon complex I felt like the biggest person in this room and to this day i am still like that so i could relate to the small guy who got all jacked and started beating people up i'm like hi that is me as well <laughs> Uh, talk about your your uh, your style. I, I know, um, man, man. A, a lot of people like they're retweeting and and sharing your some of the matches. And I'm just looking at your opponents, like, um, and I'm like, man, this this has to be like a crazy match. Talk about your style and, and what. Uh, I'm assuming that it was Benoit and Dynamite Kid that you know led you to do that style in the ring. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, um, yeah. It it was definitely them that led me to that style because it was, you know, I study so much of their matches that once you, you know, when you, when you study something enough, like what else does your imagination go to? It would be exactly what you keep looking at, but also right. training at Johnny Rods. Uh, we did like 90% of what I learned there was like legitimate, you know, shoot fighting, mat wrestling, grappling, like a technical style. And it was, always always very focused on proper technique you know getting it down it all technically and it all having to be technically sound so constantly being in competition again with guys who are twice my age and twice my size and always wanting to be the best always wanting to tap somebody out or like be faster and you know so having two years of that training where i would just get in a ring every day and you know get into like shoot fights with people that definitely played a role into my style being as aggressive as it is because that's all i've ever known since the very beginning so i i always ask this question to somebody who like they say in the business they work snug in the ring you know so what is the difference this is the outside looking in this is a wrestling fan asking this what is the difference between somebody working snug in the ring against shooting somebody how 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 uh how does your opponent realize that okay she works snug instead of like hey what's what's up with this girl so how would i describe this i guess you know working snug i personally go by this saying i say strong not stiff so when i put in a hold you can feel me like i'm, I'm putting the hold on you mm-hmm but I'm not crippling you with being I'm holding you and I'm holding you tight and you need to use your mind to escape this hole. But if I wanted to, I could break your arm. I could, you know, if you, there's a fine line between saying, Hey, I feel pressure. And then being like, Holy shit. I feel pain. I feel like she's about to break my arm. There, there's okay. a complete difference again with, you know, if I, elbow you in the face compared to me straight away breaking your nose that's two completely different things go ahead elbow me in the face all you want when you break my nose you know we're not fucking about so i'm gonna come after you and i'm probably gonna break your arm mm -hmm. so don't stop it 
Um, so I, I remember I was, uh, I used to train to do professional wrestling for a while. And, and, uh, so my trainer was tre- teaching us arm drags and without saying too much about the business, I was just doing them the wrong way. And so he started grabbing me by the arm and dragging me around the ring. And he was telling me, this is what I'm feeling. So, you know, this is what you need to fix. How important is it for you to have trust in your opponent in the ring while you're putting on a show? It is a hundred percent important because you know when you get in there you absolutely the person has to trust you and you have to trust them because when there's a lack of trust that's when shit goes wrong that's when people get injured mm-hmm. like number one that leads to injury not only does that lead to a shitty match because you know you can't communicate but if you don't trust the person and the person does not trust you like oh most certainly someone is going to get injured you just be smart and protect yourself, but you do have to give the benefit of the doubt to the other person until they prove otherwise, in my so opinion. So how, how, how does that work when you're, you know, when they say people know each other over years, they call it a day off. Like, oh, let's just go in there and have fun. I already know the way you work. You already know the way I work. How is it when you're meeting somebody for the first day? Like, hey, this is who you're working with. Oh, hey, nice to meet you. In about 20 minutes, we're about to go out there. Is it difficult for you in a short time span to develop trust? You know, what What you just said uh, about the going out there and, hey, we're wrestling in 20 minutes, that's like 90% of my career. You know, uh, in 2019, nice. like three shows a weekend for different promotions. I Half the time, I wouldn't even know who I'm working until I walk in the building. I don't know who you are, but quite honestly, I don't need to know who you are. You know, I've had people get offended, say, oh, you don't know who I am. You haven't looked up my matches before you work me. I'm like, no, I don't like it would be you know it's very nice to study your opponents now that i have the time to study my Uh opponents i would take it but i'm saying sometimes you pick up a booking last minute you have no idea you don't have time you're on the road like you know and i like i said i trust you until you give me a reason not to so i'm gonna go in and i'm gonna i'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt and i'm gonna say hey i'm I'm sure this person can work and they can protect me. And I'm also confident in my own ability to protect myself in case you are an asshat. So with that being said, until you show me that I can't trust you, I'm going to go ahead and trust you. And if you do turn out to be an untrustworthy person in the ring and I feel like you're in danger, then I'm going to take control and we're both going to be protected. So... I don't think I've ever stepped into a ring with a concern about not trusting somebody. I can't like recall off the top of my head of that happening. Um, So when people go to a wrestling show or when people meet a wrestler and they see how motivated a person is and how, you know, badass a person can be, you know, like yourself, they get illusions in their head. Like, man, maybe I can start training. Maybe I can be a wrestler. And everybody was a kid holding those fake belts, you know, on the, on the couch, you know, armrest and doing their pose and everything. But, you know, I can say for a fact, it's, it's a totally different type of training and and you need to totally be ready. What's one thing that people focus too much on when they enter the wrestling business and what's one thing that they don't focus on enough? That's a good question. Um, I would start with, they don't focus enough on honing every little detail, 100%. Like, I mean, repetition is like the number one word that comes to mind. Because when I tell you, we would just, like the trainers at at Johnny Rod be, fix your feet, fix your form. And it would be like the only two things you would hear for six hours a day, fix your feet, fix your form, do it again, repeat it again, you know? People, there aren't that many people who are willing to just do it until it is second nature where you can just be woken up out of bed at three in the morning and do whatever it is correctly to the T because your muscles remember how to do it. Right. A lot of people are focused on, you know, the look. And again, this is not a bad thing because you do need to have a good look and have a good character. But a lot of people just focus on, oh, let me get this newest gear made, let me get this robe, let me get these boots. Yeah, well, if you put all that pretty stuff on and you can't work, it doesn't mean fuck all. Fair to say. 
Yeah. I think everybody really has the illusion of what's my music going to be. And this is what my entrance is like. Um, totally, totally agree. Hey, um, so now, you, you know, I read, uh, I hope I got this right, but I read that you wrestled in six countries. Um, is there anything totally, what's the, what's the first thing you saw different about wrestling in other countries as opposed to, you know, with Johnny? Well, I praise Johnny until the end of my days because, I mean, Johnny prepared me to wrestle everywhere because he taught me to work the American style. We had a Japanese training curriculum. We had a Mexican training curriculum and it was all mixed in together. So when I arrived in Japan uh, for my first tour and this time, I was uh, well prepared to work the style and to be able to switch on and off from my left side to my right side because I had already practiced that thinking of, you know, hey, just in case. So it wasn't much of a shock to me or surprising because like, thankfully, I'd taken the time to learn and to practice these things with the thought of I'm going to just, I might need this one day and then I did, but you know, the biggest difference is like working on the on the opposite side instead of doing things on the left, doing things on the right. And I have yet to be to Mexico, but you know, I'm not much of a high flyer. They do a lot of high flying. So I mean, eventually, I'm gonna have to start jumping off the ropes. But I'm sure that they will come. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite things to talk about uh, with people who travel a lot is food. Um, what what uh what kind of food did you encounter and what what country had your favorite food when you were going out there to work did you ever did you have a lot of time did you have have time to enjoy like a good authentic meal whenever you went to these other countries or was it just straight to work no there was definitely time uh to enjoy these foods um all right uh i can start with the dominican republic because oh i love dominican food that's so good yeah, I think that was the most, um, actually, no, Japan definitely had the most, like, out there stuff that I ate, but um, I just remember being in the Dominican Republic, and the first day we got there, we, you know, got to tour around, like, you know, we got taken around the city and stuff like that, we got taken out to eat, and I tried, like, I don't know what it was, but it was, like, street food that was, like, it was, like, it was, like, a cart, I have, a, I have pictures of it. It was like a cart and it had like meat hanging off it and you could be like, hey, this is the chicken and like the pork and like whatever. I don't even remember what it was. Um, you know, my, my first thought, I was like, oh, this looks a lot like uh, those Russian stands where you might eat something and fucking pick up a parasite. But I was like, <laughs> you know, we're here. We're going to try these things. Um, and, you know, everything I ate was delicious. I'm like the snacks that I had there were good. The meat that I had there were good. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Oh, oh, and we also had some uh, some good, uh, you know, good old uh, home cooked Dominican food when we wrestled in Santo Domingo. Uh, yeah. I think it was the promoter's wife, like we because we wrestled it outside, so it was uh, we our locker room was on the roof of like somebody's house, nice. and <laughs> the ring was in the cross street. So, like, the people were in the street, and then they were gathered, like, on the roofs of the building or looking out the windows while we had the show. So, afterwards, when everything was finished, I guess, like, the promoter's wife lived, like, in one of the buildings. So, she was like, yeah, everybody come inside. Like, she made, like, chicken and beans and rice. And, yeah, that sounds you know, amazing. That was one thing about Hispanic people that they just want to feed everybody. Like, they, they <laughs> immediately treat you like family. Um, th let's go back to Japan, though. What kind, of, what kind of food did you get in Japan? And, what, and was, it, was there... I'm interested about their customs too. Tell me about their traditions and their food over there. Uh, so here I ate, I mean, honestly, sometimes I don't even know what I'm eating, but I'll just say yes and I'll try it. And I'm like, I just trust the people giving me the food. I, I don't know what it is, but um, most recently I tried crab brains. With, crab brains? Yeah. Whoa. Okay. Tell me about that. So we went out for sushi and I ordered like, the usual stuff I got I because I usually get like um crab shrimp uh tuna like egg all that good stuff mm -hmm. and then I told the girls I was like hey just surprise me like order something that you want me to try I don't know just put shit in front of me and I'm gonna eat it 
And they got me some, what do you call it? Uh, shit, I know how to say it in Russian, but not in English. Uh, damn. What are those little, like, the, the eggs? Oh, caviar? Yeah, there we go. Okay. It was that. It was like a caviar roll, and I didn't really like that. It was just a little, like, chewy and, like, weird for my liking. And then I, I saw this next roll, and it was, like, the crab body, and then there was crab brains right next to it, like, in the roll. And I was just like, all right. And you know what? It wasn't bad. Like, it, it was good. I can't really describe <laughs> it. <laughs> if you put some salt and pepper on something, it's going to be good. I, I don't know how to describe it, like, the taste, of, like, of any of this stuff. But it's good. Like, somehow it just is. Like, I, I also had this thing called albacore, and it's, like, a rare crustacean. So it's, like, it felt like I was eating cartilage because it was, like, hard and, like, crunchy and chewy. But it was still good. Like, in a normal situation, I would never eat this. And then I – but, man, it's good. I don't know what the hell to, to say. Like, everything here is good. Uh, so let's go back to your family's homeland. If my girlfriend and I go out and, and we, you know, we visit you and your mother and your mother decides to make something authentically Russian, what would, what would be the thing you tell her to make us? Borscht. <laughs> okay. What is that? So, uh, it's like one of the most commonly known Russian foods. So it's like, it's beet soup. So basically you take like beets and carrots and potatoes and like parsley and then you just like put it all in like this giant uh, pot and like make soup and then you put um, meatballs so you make the meatballs separately and then you dump the meatballs into the soup and it's like fucking delicious I, that and sounds then, amazing when you serve it in the bowl you just put like a fucking dollop of uh sour cream into it like when it's already fully served uh -huh. and i mean it is so good you just take some uh black bread and you dip it in there and then, whoo Delicious. <laughs> Always fun to talk about food. Um, so now, as a as a woman in the professional wrestling business, and like you said, you're not the biggest dog in the fight, but you you know you definitely bring a lot of fight. How do you, did you find it difficult to prove yourself because of your sex, or was it more just look at what I do in the ring. I mean, as a woman in, in the professional wrestling business, what's been your experience so far? You know, um, there's definitely been people who have doubted me. Like, I've even had other women tell me, like, oh, you can't pick me up. And I'm like, listen, just because your ass is fat don't mean I can't get you up there, okay? But, you know, I've I've never... Like, my ability... Like, I don't... I First of all, I'm not one to brag and be like, hey, I'm good or whatever, but... You know, it, I always just let my ability speak for itself and the word of my capabilities and like my toughness just gets around. So I, there was just never anybody who I wouldn't step to. And that's probably one of the most like known things about me is that I will like, I might not win, but I'm never ever going to back down from a challenge. So, you know, I've always told people you want to try it on with me, have at it. So it never really mattered that I was a woman because when I was at Johnny Rods, there was three other women there and everybody else, like the 60 other people that were there were guys. So I grew up as a kid and I was like raised in Johnny's mm -hmm. fighting guys. So it was, it never meant anything to me. Sex. Uh, uh, as far, as far as representation goes, how, how important is that to you? You know, when you have uh you know, women and little girls coming up to you after the shows, like how important is representation in professional wrestling? Um, uh, I have a little bit of a different stance to it. Cause you know, I know that there's women out there who have, uh, who are like, Hey, I have like, I looked up to like Trish Stratus or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, all the guys or the, all the wrestlers I looked up to were always men. So to me, I didn't see a difference between me being a woman and then being a man I was like I can do what they do without a doubt I never doubted that fact but you know I would have one of my friends um their sister's daughter is like in love with Sasha Banks like she's been a fan of Sasha Banks since like I don't even know I've known her for like five years and to her it means so much because you know he's like I literally want to be her like I want to be like her 
And it's, it's pretty cool to see somebody have those kind of an influence. And then when I, you know, when I meet fans, like little girls and even little boys who are, who are like, you're like the coolest wrestler I've ever, I've ever met. And when they say, I want to be like you, you know, it's always, it's always touching that I'm not doing it just for myself or like the business. Like there's actually people who go home and they talk about me and they remember me. And then they like look up my clips on YouTube. You know, it's not just social media for the other wrestlers. It's doing it for the fans. It's doing it because people out there legitimately love you. And I think that's one of the greatest things of wrestling. Having, you know, you, you talk about Johnny Rogers and you give, you give him a lot of credit. Um, having an old school guy as a trainer, because he, he has a lot of guys under his resume, a lot of professional wrestlers under his resume. I feel like the, uh, I feel like the business has evolved into something different. I, I was watching in the late eighties and the early nineties. And, you know, I, I, I have the network playing like all day in the black, in the background. So I see these old matches that I lived through and I'm like, man, now I, now I understand the story that they're telling. I totally see what's happening there. And I mean, I, I didn't appreciate it as a kid because I was just watching Macho Man and Ric Flair and Hogan and stuff. But now I'm seeing what they're trying to do. And, you know, when you turn on certain certain promotions, even WWE and AEW, you know, there's a lot of awesome, fancy, impressive stuff that I still give them credit for. Having an old school guy as a trainer, does how important was that for you to learn about storytelling in the ring rather than all the flips and the dives and stuff? It was literally like the single most important thing that I learned in my career was that old school basis because, Mm -hmm. you know, if you've ever seen my matches, you know, I'm not one to do all that flippy stuff. Like maybe I'll hit a dive here and there. I don't know, but you know, Uh, personally me it's not what I do and you know I like the story of giants and uh, I mean uh sorry David and Goliath okay that is a story that can be understood by a two-year-old or a 78 year old it's the underdog fighting the one who thinks is gonna win and they fight and they fight and the underdog wins and everyone cheers that is something that is universally understood throughout any age, throughout any race, throughout any Mm. language, you know, so that's a story that everybody can relate to because everybody's either lived it or everybody has seen it or read about it. So learning that is like the basis because you can do all the flips you want. You can do a Spanish fly and a 450 off the top rope, but for what? Why are you doing it? If there's no story like are you just doing shit just to do shit or are you really in a fight are you really in a struggle like that fight and that struggle and that emotion is the the centerpiece of wrestling because at the end of the day i mean listen there's everybody there's something for everybody there's people who like that flippy stuff no no yeah i feel like there there is a place for all that and, and it's impressive and it's awesome but, you know, watching the network and old school stuff, it's like, oh, man, I, I'm totally involved in this right now. Well, you're, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying there's a, definitely a time and a place for all that stuff. And just because I may not be a fan of it, I'm not going to knock it. It's great. And if I could do a fucking 450 off the top, I probably would. But it's telling the story, which gets the fans jumping off their damn seats and screaming. Mm-hmm. Because it's emotion and it's the story and that, like, is the bread and butter of this. Like, even if you can do nothing, even if you literally can't even get up off of the mat, you can tell that story on the mat to anybody, anywhere in the world. And wrestling is, like, a universal language simply because of that story. Who, who, are, who are some modern wrestlers that you credit to uh, or that you, uh, that you credit for being s- some good storytellers? Modern. I mean, I wish I could say that I like watch modern wrestling, but I mean, how modern are we talking? Everything I watch is like, I think it's modern, and then I look back and I'm like, oh man. You're like, holy crap, that's 15 years ago. I didn't even realize. Right. Like, I think that like I'll I'll watch it 2005, and I'm like, oh, that was yesterday, and I'm like, that was literally 15 years ago. That was 15 years ago. You know, it it sucks when you. And then when I think about the 90s, and you know, realizing that the year 1990 is exactly the same amount of time 
as the year 2050 from right now. And it's you're like, ridiculous. what the? Like, that was 10 years I ago. Know. What are you talking about? Um, so you, you've got to, you got to work with a lot of people. Um, there's one name that I, I really want to know, like how that experience was. But before I get to that question, I just want to shout out uh, CanYouHandleBar.com. Can you Handle Bar is an American-made um, facial hair product company that is awesome. They make beard wax, uh, mustache wax, beard balm, beard oil. They got cool little combs and brushes. And um, they need all the support they can get because in the pandemic, a, a lot of stuff has been uh, suffering. And it, this is a good company, guys. I really want you to check it out. Go to CanYouHandleBar.com. Use my promo code DNC Digital. And they will give you guys 15% off. So, Masha, I want to talk about Mako uh, Satamura. That, that's one badass that, you know, I am not, I'm not very cultured when it comes to professional wrestling. I, I stick with, you know, you know I'm going to be hated for this, but I stick with, you know, the, the, the mainstream stuff, the stuff I see on TV. I can catch a few YouTube clips and some social media clips. I was introduced to her uh, during the, the Mae Young Classic. I immediately knew before she even stepped in the ring, it was like her promo. It was like her promo shot. And I'm like, she's going to hurt somebody. She's going to whoop some ass. And this woman is a badass. And she seems like one of those, the OGs of the game, you know, like the one at the head of the table that, can you tell me about your experience uh, working with her and, and any, any cool story that you have from her? Uh, well, uh, going back to what I said earlier, where I don't, uh, I didn't look up to like many women in wrestling, mm -hmm. but she was one of the ones that I looked up to. I mean, I have wanted to to wrestle her for like the longest time and I've watched her, her matches and it's, you know, like you said, she looks like she's going to hurt somebody and you better believe she is. So, you know, when I finally got a chance to work uh, at her promotion, Sendai Girls, I was just like, stuttering and just like viciously bowing to her being like hello 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 thank you and, <laughs> and, you know when, when i met her and she's just like, like the, yeah, the, the, the water is over there masha oh thank you so thank you thank you yeah right. <laughs> and, and then when she's like yeah i've heard about you i was just like what <laughs> like what? what do you mean um and, and it was like when i had my match of course i came to her i'm like please like critique me tell me like what to do better and then she's just like no that like, was great like I, i'm just like she had nothing to tell you? Like, not one no, little... I was like, no, that was very good. And I was just like, uh, what? Like, what, where's the rest of the sentence? <laughs> <I couldn't laughs> um, and then uh, I ended up, I think it was the next, yeah, the next Sendai Girls show. We ended up tagging together, me and her. And I was looking forward to that match so hard. Like, I'll be, I was, like, marking out being a little kid in my head. I'm just like, yay! Like, so happy and it was just so cool that we got to you know tag together and yeah i just like our our um like double our tag moves were like crisp and on oh man and you were was, doing tag moves with her it wasn't just tagging with her you were doing tag moves with her like we did like tag moves together like we did like double kicks and like double elbows oh, man. We just like, on point and i swear to god i've never been so happy leaving a match um and I don't know if you've seen all this stuff on Twitter. We were supposed to wrestle yesterday, but if you look a little closer in the pictures, it was not exactly Miko Satomura in there. Um, it was Sakura Hirota, who was dressed up as Miko Satomura. So I will get to wrestle the real Miko Satomura at a later date, but I got to wrestle like the 99 cent store version of Miko Satomura. Jesus. <laughs> So, uh, so when you, when you talk about, uh, you know, the tag tagging up and, and having like that emotion and you're just looking at her like, holy crap, like she's my tag team partner right now. It almost reminds me of that episode of SmackDown. I remember, um, I think it was the, the episode where Edge and Hulk Hogan won the tag titles together. So Hulk Hogan is coming out and everybody knows how much Edge loves Hulk Hogan. And the, the camera shot goes to Edge, but it cuts away real quick, I guess, because it was too much behind the curtain. Edge has, like, this smile on his face, and he's tapping his toes to the song. And when you're in professional wrestling, I know you're playing a character. But at the same time, I like to look at the person playing the character, and I, I, I'm very happy for them at certain points. Like, I'm happy for you when you, you got to tag with her. That's, that's an awesome story. 
professional wrestling gets emotion out of people. It's not just the people in the audience. It's also the person in the ring. How was it difficult for you to hold on to your character and not break character and not smile and like, holy crap, this is happening right now? Um, I'm not much of a smiler, so it was less, it was less of me trying to like not smile and not mark out, but it was more, it was a little bit more of, um, me trying to be my intense and somewhat disrespectful self when all I wanted to do in my mind was be like the most respectful person in that ring. Mm. But I'm like, not what I'm here for right. like this is not what is wanted at the moment so I can just leave that shit at the door you know my instincts tell me like just be quiet and be respectful but my character is not that like to be quite honest as a person I'm not that like I I'm like I need to be an asshole right now and it's just slightly difficult to do that which was what I felt at that moment I'm like no just just be the asshole this is what they want um so, you know, you know uh, professional wrestling is an o- your only accomplishment. Um, can you tell me how you felt, and more specifically, how your mother felt when you got your degree in social science? Oh, man, my mom was so happy because, she, I mean, uh, me and her both really didn't think I could do it because, you know, I had already come back from my first tour in Japan when I started college, and during my college career, I think I had like four tours and one of them was like three months long. So I put my professors and I put my advisor through a kind of hell that I would not want to go through as an educator. I, man, I don't know, like that, the, my advisor deserves a fucking medal for putting up with me. <laughs> during that because I mean I don't even know how I honestly have no idea how the hell I graduated because I remember my entire last semester I was literally on the road like the semester started on like February 1st and my first day of walking into class was like April 17th (laughs) and I was just like hey y'all sorry I was working so I now have to catch up on two months of work and I fully credit me getting my degree to the Lord Jesus Christ because he helped me do that stuff because I did not know what the hell I was doing in my math class and I don't know how I got that work done and but I got that shit done and somehow I graduated to the biggest praise from my family probably more so than wrestling that's awesome so now you know we're, we're getting back into shows uh, little by little um how was it for you when the pandemic kid and it it shut everything down man i wanted to set myself on fire like i mean did you get a a new hobby did you i I wish i got a new hobby i didn't i didn't do anything with myself (laughs) aside from staying in the gym and weightlift every day um you know i had two courses of action that i could have taken because i had gotten an offer like right before the pandemic like like two weeks before they uh, here in marvelous they offered me to stay and they were like hey we want you to stay with us and like do a bunch of these upcoming shows like it was like i was supposed to be on the guy at japan show and we had like a bunch of other stuff planned and they wanted me to stay and train and like partake in all these shows so i had either that or i had a bunch of things lined up for me a weekend and then i had like three weeks in new york in america and then i was gonna do like a month tour in Canada and go to Russia and then come back and have a bunch of debuts already set up. Um, but I already, I've made, I've made the decision to stay and then I just kind of watched America like set itself on fire with the pandemic. Like everything just got canceled. And, you know, I was like, it, at first I was like, oh, I'm so happy I'm in Japan. Cause like I could a lot, like I lost, essentially I lost all the Canada and America bookings. And I was like, oh, thank God, I'm, I'm still in Japan, I can wrestle. And then Japan shut it down, and I was like, fuck me. I was like, I, I don't, I think that was like the single most frustrating time in my career. Because I was, I just remember like sitting outside of the dojo and being like, 
you know, you just go like one step forward and like 50 feet back. Like it was just ridiculous, you know, but I just, all I, all I knew was, Hey, I'm just going to stay here and I'm going to keep working and do what I can in my power. And eventually something good is going to come out of it. And I mean, I guess that happened when, when shows started back up and things kind of started getting rolling over here again the past couple of months. So what was, what was your first bump like after a long time? Did it, did it, uh, did it hurt? And was, was it, was it a sore day? Because I remember watching the undertaker's uh, documentary and he was talking about that. He thought that those one match a year things would be good for his body. But when you take away the repetition, when you take away, like, I'm so used to bumping, you know, 50 times a match. And was that first bump a difficult one for you? Or was it just easy to get back into it? I mean, you were talking about going to the gym and, and weightlifting, and that that's a good thing to do with your time off. But what was your first match like back? Uh, well, I think, um, I guess I neglected to mention that we never stopped training because I live mm. in the, dome. um, the ring is 50 feet away from my room right now. Like, Oh, is that, you live like, in the, Oh, that's awesome. I live in the, like, I can, I literally like the, the, the dojo, like the garage where everything is, is mm -hmm. legitimately like five feet from, from our front door. So nice. when the pandemic happened, we stopped like having shows. We kept training every single day, once or twice a day. Like I never stopped bumping. I, you know, like I, we would have our training, go weightlift when I had the rest of my day to do fuck all with. Mm -hmm. But we we were still like we were filming like a documentary uh, and like, like training and stuff. So I'm like that. Like nothing didn't really stop for me. Without without having shows, but you're still training. Do you feel like this was a actually a good time for a lot of professional wrestlers to maybe step back and reset their maybe their characters or reset their move set? Was this a do you feel like there was a silver lining in having all this time off for a professional wrestler? I feel like there's definitely people who benefited from it. Like, I mean, I know I can list off a bunch of people who didn't benefit from it, who like mm -hmm. had a bunch of shit set up. And I mean, it, it sucks because they have like once in a lifetime stuff. So I'm not going to say this is a good thing by any chance, you know, but it definitely was beneficial for some people because, you know, but like wrestlers, we run, you get an injury, you put some tape on it and you keep on going. Like mm -hmm. so many people needed to take those couple of months get surgery, heal up their bodies, do some fucking yoga classes, you know, get their gear made, wash their gear, work on their character, study the matches, you know. If you are still working during this pandemic, then you truly love this business. If you literally just sat on the couch, didn't even lift a weight, didn't do a push-up and just ate ice cream for six months, well, that shows me your commitment to it because the people who were committed took the rest that they needed and then they got right back to work doing everything possible to stay relevant and keep their things going. Did you allow yourself to rest? Or do you even allow yourself to rest? Uh, some Sometimes, like, I'll have, like, a day off, maybe. I usually am training, like, like, three, like, anywhere from two to four times a day, every single day, depending on the day. And then some days when I'm like, I want to take it easy, instead of weightlifting, I'll do power yoga, which I force myself to take a day off from lifting and do power yoga, which is a workout in itself. But Maybe I, I, ju I just that. started yoga. I, 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 I need to learn what power yoga is, but I just started yoga and that shit is no joke. I am sitting oh, there power like... Yoga is like next level. It's like yoga on crack. All right, we're going to have to, we're, you're going to have to send me a message uh, later on after we're done with this to teach me that because I was, I was sitting there trying to stretch and my girlfriend was laughing at me because I was like, hey, pull my leg even farther because I know I, I know it can go farther, but I can't do it myself. No, power yoga is like pretty extreme because it's like yoga, but it's a lot faster. And sometimes you do it with weights. So it's like a whole different animal. Like, I mean, I've done workouts and I'm just like dead, especially when it's hot outside. And it's basically like doing hot yoga and power yoga together, which is like what a day off for me is, or just like doing morning cardio. But something is going to get done that day anyway. So it's like, I don't know what. Well, what do you, what, what are you looking forward to the most when we finally have shows with crowds and stuff like, you know, sold out crowds, full house? Um, 
Well, speaking as I'm currently in Japan and I'm going to remain here, um, I'm just looking forward to being allowed to have these streamers again. Like, I want the streamers for our entrances. Oh, the stream. Oh, nice. And I want people to scream because people are not allowed to, like, scream right now. They're just allowed to, like, clap and stuff. So mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to people actually, like, ooing and aahing and, like, cheering, you know? Um, just get louder, I guess, is what I want. I'm like, I want more people. I want more energy, more loud. The streamers, I want it all. But, again, compared to literally just doing live tapings in our dojo with no audience, because we still were holding shows every two weeks, live taped here, having actual people is, like, I'm, I was so thankful to finally walk back into our venue and have people. I was like, this is the greatest day of my life. Hey, so uh, we're coming to the tail end of this interview, and I want to thank you for all your time. This is really cool. I, I really enjoyed it, and I, I hope you did too. Um, can you tell me what's your favorite Black Sabbath song? <laughs> Put me War Pigs. <laughs> nice. Okay. And here's a funny question that I, I never thought i'd ask a professional wrestler what what's your favorite corner yo i actually asked that question on twitter because i was like does anybody else have a favorite corner or am i just crazy so um it's yeah like, that's exactly why i'm asking it because i'm like i need to i need to hear this it's like the right hand top corner if like but and everybody would pick that differently, I suppose. But it's like to me, to me, depending on uh, the door that I walk into, or like where I think, like yeah, I was about to ask you: is this is this the top right from the aisle or from hard cam? Uh, it's but it's it's not okay. But like my favorite, we're not talking about like shows like camera angle wise because I okay. guess in that sense, I I work camera. But I'm saying like if I'm going into like stretch, I will sit in the corner that. Like, when I was in Johnny Rods, it would be, like, the door was here, and then we had, like, the locker rooms here. So, this was the entrance, and then it was, like, this was, like, the top right, or, like, the top left corner. Okay, so okay. always, like, that same corner, which, what I would think in relation, in my mind, I'm just, like, yeah, it's that one. So, I'll, like, gravitate that one. So I don't know. I'm, I'm fucking crazy, man. Like, it's, like, the top right corner of whatever geographical location I think the building's in. Uh, last question. What do you want people to walk away with after they watch one of your matches? I, I would like you to probably hate me (laughs) and be like, wow, what a dick. But I just, I want to make people feel like I want more like I want you to, to want the other person to win. Cause that's what I'm there for. Is I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm like the big bad dickhead. But it's, like, I just want, like, I want you to literally be excited. Like, I want you to watch my match and be, like, fucking hyper afterwards. Be, like, holy shit, that was a fight. And, like, my my heart rate's racing. That's awesome. So, Masha, where, where can they find you on social media? I am on Instagram and Twitter, at Masha Slamovich. And I have a pro wrestling tea store, which is also uh, at Masha Slamovich. And I guess you can YouTube my and look up some of my matches, YouTube at Masha Slamovich, which is not an account. It's just a search. But yeah, <laughs> there we go. Awesome. Um, Masha, I want to thank you so much. I hope you had a good time. Uh, this is do you like, comment, and subscribe. Um, I keep bringing all these interviews uh, once a week, and I, I hope I do well for for you guys I, I try my best to do these interviews and masha is definitely on her way i want to thank her for doing the show everybody have a good night and take care of yourselves